Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Sharon, for inviting me. Thank you for the warm introduction. So I'm going to give a brief overview as to mitral valve regurgitation secondary to LV dysfunction, which is the, um, the title of the whole day's events. And it, it tends to get missed what's happening to the LV in mitral disease. We focus a lot on the leaflets and the cords and all our different repair techniques, but the LV plays a very big role. I've used some of the pictures from Carpontia's Reconstructed Valve Surgery, which is really an amazing textbook um, on valve repair, if you're interested. So normal mitral valve function is dependent on the ventricular valvular complex. And the annulus, the leaflets, play a role together. And the, the main thing we're after is a coaption surface. So that during systole, the mitral valve doesn't leak. And you want a coaption surface up to eight millimeters to a centimeter. And it's all based on the relative free edge height as well as the size of the annulus. That's what's going to cause whether the mitral valve leaks or not. So left ventricular dysfunction does result in annular dilatation. It also could change the relative free edge height. You can have some of the free edge a bit higher, some a bit lower, both a bit lower. So LV causes of MR is functional mitral regurgitation with relatively normal leaflets and core apparatus. And that can be divided into the ischemic MR, which I'll talk about, and the dilated annulus or left ventricle. Hocum, which we've discussed already and we'll be discussing later today, um, with systolic anterior motions, also LV cause of MR, which I'm going to leave to the side. So LV dilatation, so on my left you have a normal uh, ventricle, normal cord length, normal papillary muscle position. As the left ventricle becomes dilated, during systole, with the same cord length, the mitral leaflets get pulled inwards and they don't collapse, you get MR. If it's just purely an annular dilatation, well obviously the leaflets can't meet at the edge, like the door frame of a double door. If the door frame is larger, well then you're going to have a leak between it, even if the doors are the normal size. Ischemia during systole, an acute ischemia, if the LV is not contracting and you have a low ejection fraction, well then it, the, the leaflets won't be able to reach the, the correct approach and the correct height. Papillary muscle elongation. Here this papillary muscle has not decreased in size in systole as it should. This is not a very common thing, but we do see it, and the leaflet height may ride a few millimeters higher than the other leaflet. Inferior infarction, and this is something that surgeons, that's what we classically call ischemic MRs, when there's a posterior infarct, so a PDA territory infarct, or sometimes a lateral wall infarct, and the posterior medial papillary muscle is pulled outwards with a normal cord length and a normal posterior leaflet, and that gives you a posteriorly directed jet of MR. There are leaflet changes in functional MR, um, even if we think the leaflets are normal. There are pathological leaflets in heart failure when we look at autopsy studies. They're stiffer, they have increased collagen, there's less water, they're thicker. So ischemic mitral regurgitation, the definition is MR due to ischemia or infarction. There can be acute LV ischemia, chronic LV remodeling due to infarction, papillary muscle dysfunction and rupture are less common but obviously serious causes of MR. So acute MR, papillary muscle rupture, dysfunction, acute LV dilatation. Now IMR occurs much more commonly with an inferior infarct than with an anterior infarct. So papillary muscle rupture, uh, more common with the posterior medial due to RCA occlusion, and this is because the anterior lateral um, papillary muscle is supplied by the LAD and the circumflex, so it has a dual blood supply, so it's less likely to be infarcted and have a complete rupture. They present with torrential MR because the anterior and the posterior leaflets are attached to each papillary muscle. So if you lose the posterior medial, you get a flail of the anterior and the posterior leaflets at A3 and P3. And with torrential MR, they come in cardiogenic shock in addition to the size of the infarct they've had. And they're pretty hard to get through surgery. So chronic ischemic MR is something that surgeons are very interested in. You get LV dilatation. If it's global, you get a central MR jet. If it's focal, you can get a like I discussed with posterior infarct. Pat muscle elongation, you get an eccentric jet, but that's much less common. It's much more likely in multivessel coronary artery disease, more common RCN function. The LV is normally elongated and you get increased sphericity, and that contributes to the MR. Has a much higher mortality and increased heart failure. So here's a sheet model of ischemic MR from JTCBS 2003, and this is looking at the mitral valve area according to the cardiac cycle. And ischemia is in the open boxes, pre-ischemia in the closed boxes. And what they did is they included the LAD, the proximal circumflex, or the distal circumflex. Now sheep are left dominant, so a proximal circumflex will have the lateral wall and the inferior wall, a distal circumflex, only the inferior wall. 
And what they found with LAD ischemia, the mitral valve area stayed much the same during the cardiac cycle, whether it was ischemic or not. But proximal circumflex occlusion had a very big difference. The mitral annulus did not decrease in size appropriately. And also they found there's a leaflet edge separation at the posterior commissure, much more than the center, much more than the anterior, which is what we see clinically. Similarly, posterior papillary muscle tip length from the free edge of the leaflet to the, to the papillary muscle head with ischemia compared to the anterior papillary muscle and with each vessel that they occluded. And the proximal circumflex, the papillary muscle didn't shorten at all in the uh, posterior. And the anterior wasn't as affected. So again, very similar to what we see in surgery. So here's a classic picture from Caponti's book with a posterior infarction. So you have an infarction over here. The papillary muscle is pulled down. The cords are pulled down. And you get this tenting at the P3 area. And you get an increased AP diameter as well. The SAVE trial was a trial from 1997, a randomized trial in patients post-infarct that had poor ejection fraction um, to an early generation ACE inhibitor versus placebo. And in that subset, those with MR had a much higher mortality, severe heart failure, increased LV sericity. So ischemic MR is a serious problem. Here's a long-term prognostic outcome from circulation 2001. 300 patients followed for five years that had a QA of AMI, 194 with IMR, 109 without IMR. And they had a much higher risk of mortality, independent of their left ventricular ejection fraction. And we do see patients that have ischemic MR with relatively normal ejection fractions. So here's the classic picture of a segmental dilatation with that P3 elongation, and you have a gap over there with the posteriorly directed jet, and a global dilatation of the LV with a greatly increased AP diameter, and this AP diameter can be more than the lateral diameter. Here's some nice echo pictures of a normal LV, and this is the tenting height to make a line across the annulus and then to the tip of the, the coaption. And with LV dilatation, you have an increased area, and we look at the tenting height. So the tenting height's greater than a centimeter, they're much less likely to be repairable. And there can be asymmetric tenting and symmetric tenting. So symmetric tenting, with global LV dilatation, you'll get central MR, and with asymmetric, you'll get usually a posteriorly directed MR. So how do we treat it? Well, surgically, we have in the past tried to repair these valves, and we can address annular dilatation with annular plasty and reduce the size, remodel it. There are also percutaneous approaches, mitral clip, there are coronary sinus annular plasty devices, and valve replacement obviously is very reliable. So annular plasty has been the mainstay of surgical repair for functional MR and ischemic MR, but it's really a ventricular problem, and so we're answering it with an annular solution. It doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but that's what we've been doing, and it seems to work okay, but there are some studies that will question that. So the annular plasty is usually anchored in the part of the LV that will dilate, and this is the part that will dilate, the lateral wall, the free wall. The anterior leaflet is centered at the, we talked about with the anatomy session, between the right and the left fibrous trigone, aorta mitral curtain. This doesn't tend to dilate as much, but it can. So we're addressing this area here. We also want to decrease the AP diameter. And so there are semi-rigid rings or bands, and there are flexibles. And the results show that a rigid ring is probably the best, because it really keeps the AP diameter tight. The ischemic MR ring, there's a, an Edwards ring that is narrower at the P3 area on purpose to correct this asymmetric dilatation. So repair or replace, it's the, the great question. We don't really know the answer, but we do have some trials that will help us. So this was published in the New England Journal in 2016, two-year outcomes of surgical treatment of severe ischemic MR. It was a randomized trial of 251 patients to repair or replacement. They didn't tell us the details of what type of repair they did. They didn't tell us whether it was a complete ring, a partial ring, rigid or flexible. The primary endpoint, it was powered to LV and systolic volume index. It wasn't powered for mortality or heart failure. There was no significant difference in the end systolic volume or mortality, but the recurrent moderate or severe MR was 58% at two years in the repair group, which is just astounding. And it kind of has started to change practice, and surgeons now are tending to replace. There was much more heart failure emissions um, in the repair group. The reason we tended not to replace in the past is there were the studies from 20 years ago, replacement had a much higher early mortality. So mitral valve replacement carried a mortality standalone of at least 5%, and repair was about 1%. Um, and we're not really sure why, but a lot of them died of early heart failure. And the early replacements, we used to cut out the entire mitral apparatus, cut out the cords, 
cut out the posterior leaflet, cut out the anterior leaflet. Now when we replace, we do a caudal sparing replacement, link all those attachments, and that seems to help with elderly dysfunction. What about moderate IMR? What about if you're doing a cabbage and someone's got moderate ischemic mitral regurgitation? What do you do then? So in the past, again, we were doing a lot of repairs, a lot of annuloplasties. This had the effect of improving our cabbage results because you were taking the patients that were sicker with poor LVs and some MR and you were calling them a mitral cabbage. But it also had the effect of making your mitral results look better because they were moderate MRs and they tended to do better. So this is a randomized trial. Patients undergoing cabbage to repair or cabbage um, alone. And at one year, you know, 31% of the patients that didn't have the repair had MR, but 11% still had it, the ones that had repair. But there was no difference in mortality and systolic volume index, MACE, deaths, functional status, quality of life. And surgeons now are tending to leave the moderate MRs alone. Just throw this in the Everest trial um, with mitral clip randomized trial, mitral clip versus surgery. Well, you know the mitral clippers had reasonable results, but a high crossover of patients required surgery in the mitral clip. Um, there was no difference in the um, functional status. And for the functional MR group, there was no significant difference in mortality or symptoms. There are other options that are a bit more novel, so you can sew the papillary muscles together and that kind of tense them at the correct height. Um, not many surgeons are doing this, probably less than 1% for ischemic MRs. Um, sometimes the secondary cords, the anterior leaflet, are tenting it down, so it's reasonable to cut them at the time of surgery. Um, there's something else that you can put around the papillary muscles and then there's the Carillon device that we are doing. But if you look at the anatomy of the coronary sinus, it does ride slightly higher than the annulus. It has had some effect, but not as good as we could have hoped. So in summary, MR due to LV dysfunction, you can have LV systolic dysfunction, LV dilatation, global segmental, papillary muscle dysfunction. Now there's conjecture when to intervene. Moderate MR, we're undergoing cabbage, most of us leave it alone, and conjectures how to intervene. Do we repair, do we replace, or do we do something transcatheter? And we are increasingly more replacing these valves now than we were in the past. Thank you.